Today we're talking about interactive Google Slides, um, mostly focused on grades three through six. So hopefully you're in the right session. <laughs> And I will wave hello. My name is Delaine Johnson. I work in the Clovis East area. So I'm an AP computer science principals teacher at Clovis East. And then I have the privilege of spending the rest of my day with elementary students at Boris and Reagan. And, uh, you know, a little bit around the district as well. So hopefully I've had a chance to meet many of you in person. And uh, again, one more reminder about changing your name if you'd like credit for today's session. Make sure that you adjust that so it includes your full name as it's shown on your badge. Really quick, if you have questions, please use that chat feature. There might be an opportunity for you to open up your mic and live ask your questions towards the end. But if there's a process that I'm walking through and you need to see that again or you missed a step, we have a fantastic moderator with us today. He'll probably say hello in the chat here in a second. <laughs> um, and lots of friends that could answer your questions for you. Uh, we have over 51 participants. So somebody will probably know that answer if I'm not able to get to you right away. But generally, please don't be shy about asking questions in chat. So let's talk about our Simon Sinek's golden circle. That's one of the driving forces for me is my why, my how, and my what. So what is our why for creating in, like interactive Google Slides? So we're looking for engaging pedagogy, right? We want some best practices for online learning. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to engage with some peer interactions. Our students are missing each other and we're missing our students, right? I know for sure that not being with them in person has been tough for all of us. And so how do we get those social emotional connections and make sure that they're engaged with their peers and not feeling so isolated? So here's a couple of whys for really um, building out slide decks for your lessons that get them engaged and get them connecting. So how do we do this, right? We need activities and challenges that really extends students' thinking, right? So sometimes there's a tool for every pace of learning and a worksheet might be a great tool, but it's not the only tool that we have. So how do we use slides beyond just fill in the blank, right? And finally, our what? We need students to demonstrate their four Cs. How do they show you what they know? Um, there's so many different ways for them to be able to do that, whether it's in Flipgrid with a video, right? Or it's writing a report. So as we look at the universal design for learning and different ways for students to demonstrate their learning, this is one way that we can do that. So this is a part of um, the golden circle. Okay, if you are brand new to Google Slides, whoa, 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 Delane, I'm not ready. That's okay, I gotcha. So there is a link to a slide deck and that bit.ly link is there in the lower right hand corner. And you won't need to rush to write this down if you have the, um, bit.ly link that is cusd slash igs. Um, I have linked out an introduction to Google Slides slide deck. So it walks you through the very basics on how to get started, how to create a new slide deck from Google Drive, how to modify the layout, how to insert a text box. Um, so that is there as a backup for you because I know many people have never had an opportunity to use Google Slides and I absolutely know what it's like to start from the beginning. Also, please feel free to email me or I will connect you with your friendly local TOSA for your area. There's a wonderful group of human beings that enjoy doing tech uh, with our curriculum. And so I'll make sure to get you connected if you're not sure who your TOSA is. Okay, how are we doing so far? <laughs> you ready? Okay, so let's get creating, right? There's gonna be, um, a couple of things that I'm gonna do live demo for. I hope that you have an opportunity to practice the skills while I'm going over them. So how do I practice those skills? If Zoom has taken up your entire laptop screen, you can use the escape key on your keyboard to get out of full screen Zoom. And this will allow you to split the screen. You can shrink what I'm talking about and kind of minimize your Zoom window. And then you can open up Google and go into your drive and start practicing the skills. Or if you're much more comfortable watching and taking notes or waiting for the video, because um, we will have this video posted next week. 
I'm very excited for that. Um, however you learn best. So let's get creating. Our goal for today, we are going to be talking about five features inside of Google Slides. We're going to look at how to create a master slide. Now, what exactly is a master slide? If you've never heard this term before, we're going to go over that. So we're also going to take a look at how to get links to outside resources into your slide deck. So for example, if there is a really great website that I want my students to go to, like BrainPop, how do I get the link to the BrainPop video inside of my Google slide deck? We're also going to practice finding images and icons. So to give your slides some visual appeal. If you notice, I have a fun little bitmoji on a lot of my slides, and it's just one way for me to insert a bit of silly personality um, as students are going through the learning. And as a side tip, I'll show you where to get the bitmojis too. <laughs> uh, we'll look at using audio and video. So how do we embed us talking to our students or that really amazing YouTube video that we need to help support the lesson. I'll talk to you about what you need to make sure that that YouTube video works for students. And then finally, now I've made all this great stuff, Delane. How do I share this with my students? So I'll walk you through a couple of ways that you can get your work out to your students so they can start creating and demonstrating their learning. Sound good? Okay. So I would love for you to join me in an example of what a master slide looks like. So on slide 10 and 11 are two examples of master slides that I've built for students to use. If you would like to be able to actually click and type on these two examples, there is a bit.ly link in the speaker notes. So you'll need to come to this interactive Google Slides link and so that's been posted in the chat. Again, that's C-U-S-D in all caps and I-G-S. And you'll need to put that all the way up in the address bar. You can't do a Google search for a bit.ly link. Um, so make sure that you get that all the way up at the top. And then you can get an example of these two master slides. So I'll show you what that looks like. When you click on this link, it's example I-G-S 20, and we'll get that posted in the chat. It'll take you to a page that looks like this. And then you'll just need to click on use template. So that way it is your own copy. You're making changes to your work and you can beg, borrow, steal for these two slide decks. If you'd like to use them, um, please, if they are useful for you. So I'm gonna click on use template. And while we are waiting for that to make a copy for me, here we are. So a Freyer model, this is a master slide. Now, what do I mean by a master slide? When you are inside of a brand new slide deck, on the left-hand side, you have this plus button to add a slide and a tiny little down arrow to pick the layout. So there are 11 predetermined layouts made by Google. Sometimes these layouts don't work for what we need to do for students. So if you're just looking at title and body, you're putting in a title and you're typing in some text. Um, so I like to mix things up. By creating a master slide, I am actually modifying the layout. So I'm taking one of these pre-made layouts and adding extra elements. So it looks like something that came directly from Google Slides, but I manually made those. And we're gonna go through the process to do that. So let's talk about a Freyer model. If you haven't seen Freyer model before, Oh, yes, thank you for um, posting the bit.ly link there in chat for this example of master slides. Um, the Freyer model allows you to use these four squares to describe a concept. So in the middle of this Freyer model is a box that says click to add title. This is the word that we would be focused on or the concept that we would be focused on. So for example, I'm in science and I have the word mantle. Now, mantle can mean a couple of different things, right? For some of us, a mantle is a fireplace. But in science, we're talking about the Earth's crust, right? So I could click in here, and I could easily add the word mantle by clicking to add title. Do you notice that the box itself are clickable, but the background is not. This table with the boxes is locked in. 
and I added these colorful little text boxes for students to click on. So that's the process of the master slide. But let me keep talking about the Freyer model. So in this example, students put in a concept in the middle and they have four ways to describe that concept. You can use these four boxes how you best see fit. So in some examples, I've done synonyms or antonyms. I've done examples and non-examples. So what do you mean by examples and non-examples? Let's say that it's a math concept and the number is nine. An example would be four plus five and a non-example would be seven plus three. So students are demonstrating to you that they understand how to make the number nine. You, they could also use different um, manipulatives so they can put in nine images as an example and then put in a dime as a non-example. You can do definitions. So students write out the definition of the word. You can ask them to include it in a sentence. So have them write out the sentence. You can ask them to find an image that represents the concept. So again, back to mantle, I could easily ask them, okay, go out, find an image of mantle and put that in one of the boxes. So Freyer model is a fantastic way to help students um, really get attached to a concept and show you in four different ways that they understand it. The second slide is just a really quick Venn diagram. It takes, um, once you get used to the master slide process, this took me about three minutes to add two shapes, change the color, and add four text boxes. So it's, once you really get used to it, it's kind of fabulous to be able to build out things that students can't delete. So if you notice, I'm clicking, I can't move this circle shape in the Venn diagram. The only thing that I can manipulate are the text boxes. So students can't accidentally delete items. Loving this concept? Okay, I'm gonna walk you through how to build out a master slide. Again, hit that escape key on your keyboard if you'd like to get out of full screen Zoom and you wanna play along at home. Um, one keyboard shortcut trick, love sharing this trick. If I would like to build out a new Google slide deck, but I don't feel like going over here to the waffle and then going into drive or going into slides. I can come up to this address bar and I can type in slides.new. So I'm going to show that to you right there, slides.new. You can do singular slide.new or presentation.new, but I like slides.new. And that will create a brand new blank Google slide deck with as little clicking as possible because I'm actually a very lazy person. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that little trick is helpful for you. So here we go. We have this blank slide deck. And when I look at the different layouts, I only have these 11 layouts. And I know I want to make a master slide. So the example that I think we could build together is a mind map. Right. So in a mind map, you have a central concept and you have a bunch of bubbles and lines that link out to a different concept. So how do I make sure that those are locked into place so students can manipulate the text boxes, maybe change the font size and font color, but they're not accidentally deleting the individual thought extensions. So let's practice building a mind map. Where we need to go is up here to the top under slide. You're going to scroll all the way down until you see edit master. Okay, this is the background and the secret sauce to Google Slides. So if this is your first time in the master slide deck, I want to caution you, everything that you change here will change universally down across your slide deck. So if you are in an existing slide deck, and for example, you change the font style, it's going to change everything in your slide deck to match that font style. So I would say careful about deleting the existing 11 layouts. It could be a little bit scary when you accidentally erase whole entire pieces of your slides. And I'm not trying to scare you, just a heads up. Okay. So to make a master slide, I actually need to borrow one of these layouts. Um, the one I love to borrow the most is called title and body. It's the easiest one for me to manipulate. What you can do is you're going to uh, select the one that says title and body, hover over it till it turns blue, and then right mouse click on it. You can copy it and paste it, or you can duplicate it. So whichever process is easiest for you to make a copy. 
I'm going to go ahead and click on duplicate layout because it's one less thing that I have to click. <laughs> but if copy paste works for you, it's perfect. Okay, so now here I am. I'm going to duplicate layout. And I can tell that I have an identical one with an extra number in the title here at the top. So this first one is called title and body. My duplicate is now called title and body one. I always rename from the beginning because I have a tendency to not wait. What was I working on? If I have to step away, there's an interruption, a student needs help. And all of a sudden, what was I doing? Is that just me? No. <laughs> so I'm going to take this layout and I can rename. So when I click rename, we're going to do mind map because that's what I plan out, plan on building out. And that'll help me remember in case I have to step away. Now, because I have added a whole new slide, this doesn't affect every single slide that I have in Google, right, in my drive. This only affects one presentation. So if you accidentally mess up master slides, you can leave that presentation, build out a brand new one, and it will be just as it was. So don't worry about making too many mistakes. We definitely have your back. Just make a new presentation. <laughs> So here we go. I have my mind map. Some things that I can do inside of master slides. I can do some pretty fun things like change the background and I can pick a color. So this is true of all slides. I'm just pointing out what you can do inside of master slides. And so the slide itself will start making those changes the minute that the students add it to their deck or that you add it to the deck. So wait a second, what am I talking about? Over here, I'm going to bump out of master slides really quick by clicking on the X. When I hit this little drop down arrow to talk about layouts, that mind map has already shown up on those layouts. So I'm going to add this particular layout so you can watch it change as I'm editing the slide master. So again, we go up to slide, we edit the master. And I do this all the time to kind of take a look at my changes. I'll do two or three things. I'll exit the master editor, take a look at the slide. I'll come back in and make edits. So um, I'm constantly checking on my work. All right, so my map has a central concept, right? I'm going to add a shape. And so there's two ways to get a shape in. You can find that shapes icon in the visual menu, or you can go up to insert, select shape, and then pick from a specific category. So I'm gonna do callouts. And because it's a mind map, of course I have to do a cloud call out. <laughs> so I'm gonna click on cloud and I'll just click hold and drag and create a little shape here. Do you see these red lines? This helps me center my shapes. So this is a part of like a ruler grid. And when I have this crosshair of the red lines, it means that I have put my shape perfectly in the middle. So just in case you've ever seen those. Another way to organize your shape is to come up to the arrange button all the way at the top at slides. And there is a center on page button. So I can center it horizontally and it'll jump to the middle wherever it's at. And if I go back up to arrange, center on page, and vertically, it'll jump to the middle for whatever it's at, up and down. So horizontally, we'll go left and right. Vertically, we'll go up and down. And now I still have my little shape in the middle. If I jump out of master slides, I can't click on this bubble. I have a ginormous text box, and I have a big title box. So I need to arrange my text boxes so they fit on top of my thought bubble, and I need to add some more shapes. So let's go through that process. You'll go up to Slide and Edit Master if you popped out of the Master Editor. And I have this title box that's already ready for me to go. So I'm going to resize this title box. And I'm going to click, hold, and drag and put it right over my cloud shape. Do you notice how I'm looking for that red intersection? So I know it's right there in the middle. Well, wait, 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 wait. What just happened to my text box? I don't see the words anymore. So this could potentially happen to you. When you think about the different pieces on a Google slide deck, it's like paper. 
So the last thing that I add is going to be the first thing on top of the deck. It's that very first piece of paper. The last thing I added was the cloud. So that cloud is going to sit on top of anything else on the slide deck. So that text box is actually under the cloud. How do I get it to pull forward so I can actually see it? It's a great question. Can I hear your thoughts? <laughs> so we're going to go back up to arrange. And this time we're going to pick order and we're going to ask it to bring to front. So I'm going to take that text box and pull, pull it like a piece of paper on top of the stack. Now I can see the wording. Some other things that we can do, we can change the font style. So maybe I like news cycle and the font size. I can hit this negative button to make it smaller, or I can click on the number and change it to a predetermined size. I can also use my alignment button to center it, to make sure that their concept is right there in the center of that bubble. And I can center it vertically as well in the middle. So now I have a font bubble and I've got a text box that's ready inside of that thought bubble. Now, what do I do with this really, really big text box? Well, I need a shape to extend some concepts. So what I'm gonna do is go up to that shapes button and I'm just gonna pick a little rounded rectangle for my first thought. And I'm gonna click, hold and drag. And I need this text box to fit inside of that shape. What I can do is use my resizer handles and I'm just gonna drag it until I think it's about the right size. Did you see what happened to the font? Okay, so I'm gonna drag this back out in case you missed it. I have all of these bullet points, first level, second level, third level. I actually can't delete that. This is a part of the information that comes with Google Slides, but students don't see this when we go back to the live slide. So this is background information. I would absolutely love to delete these items. It's built in, it's a part of the programming. So when you shrink your text box, those bullet points get a little weird and it's okay, right? So I'm gonna move this text box and try to get it over the shape here and fit inside so it matches up. Uh-oh, what happened to me again? Right, that arrangement, the text box was one of the first things on the slide, so it's towards the bottom of the stack. So I have to make sure that it's blue in those outlines. Go up to arrange, find order, and bring to front. So it looks like a hot mess, right? On the master slide. But let's take a look at what it actually appears in the slide deck. So I'm gonna exit out of master slides. And now I have this beautiful slide deck with a thought bubble that says click to add title, ready to go, and an extension that says click to add text that's ready to go. So it's looking great, it's getting on target, but I need a couple of more extensions in order to make, you know, let's say that we want four or five extensions in this mind map. So where do I need to go? Slide, edit master, and I told you earlier that I love my shortcuts and I try to do as few clicks as possible. So what I wanna do is duplicate both the text box and the shape together. So I'm not trying to move a bunch of things around. So how do I do this? First thing I clicked on was the text box. I'm gonna press and hold my shift key on the keyboard and then I'm gonna try to click that shape. Oh, I caught it. So let me do that for you again. I'm gonna click on the text box press and hold the shift key on the keyboard and then click on the shape. So now I have both items selected and my keyboard shortcut that I love is control D for duplicate. So you can definitely right mouse click, copy paste. You can use your keyboard shortcuts, control C for copy and control V for paste. But I am a huge fan of control D for duplicate because it's one less thing that I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. I duplicated that one. I'm going to control D and duplicate another one. See how it looks a little messy on the master? Right. It's okay because what it actually looks like when we go back to the slide deck, students don't see the background. So I'm going to control D one more time and let's drag one over here. 
So I've got four ways for students to give me thoughts, information when I exit the master slide. Beautiful, ready to go. I have a shape and they can click to add text. Yeah, I can already hear you. Oh, Delaine, it looks boring. It's, it's gray and it's yellow. You can absolutely change the background. So slide, edit, master. And when I click on a text box, I'm sorry, I want the shape. So don't click on the text box. You're gonna click on that shape and there is a paint bucket at the top. When you click on that paint bucket, you can pick any color you like to help those stand out. The other thing I'd like to do is kind of predetermine the font style and the font size so students have some extra room to write. So let's do this again. I'm gonna click on the shape. Oop, I got the text box that time, so I'm gonna move my mouse a little bit and I'm gonna click on the shape. I'm gonna find that paint bucket at the top and I will pick a different color for that particular shape and then I can make adjustments. Oop, let me go to that text box and we'll make this 12 and we'll change this to Patrick Hand. Let me do that again for this text box. Didn't quite get it right the first time. So there we go, when I exit out of master slides. Automatically adjusted font and background colors. Okay, so let's take a look at our chat here. Can we upload worksheets so that students can draw on them to submit them digitally? And then, or do we have to do bubbles over them? So yes, Jessica, thank you for answering that question. Absolutely. When you have a PDF, you just need to change it into an image. And in that PDF, when you have it as an image, you can set it as the background. And then I would add the text boxes over the individual pieces that you want students to fill out. Um, I can go through how, what you need to do to change the layout of your slide deck so it looks like a piece of paper. So this is a really handy trick to know. Uh, up here at the top, we're gonna go to File. You'll go all the way down to Page Setup. And by default, it's widescreen 16 by nine. So when I click that drop down arrow, I need custom and I'm going to make this an eight and a half by 11 inches. When I click apply, the entire slide deck squishes to look like a piece of paper. Now it is entire slide deck only. We can't pick one slide to be eight and a half by 11 and then the next slide to be widescreen. So pick the one format and it'll stay that way for the entire slide deck. Do you notice that my layout changed? Right, so I still have my mind map. It is just now looking like a piece of paper and in, um, what is that, hot dog mode? Instead of in hamburger mode, I always get those backwards. Is it in hamburger mode and then it's hot dog mode? <laughs> so portrait and landscape, your layouts will absolutely adjust. So thank you friends for helping out with those questions. Um, if you are unsure about how to create a PDF and turn it into, a, an image, right? Um, that process is available in Adobe and the district gives us full access to Adobe Creative Suite. So that'll be in there. You can email me and I can walk you through that process um, or a quick Google search to let you know, you know, how do I convert a PDF to a PNG? Um, one of my favorite websites to go to is called PDF Candy. I believe it's .com. So PDF Candy lets you do so many things, whether it's to create a PDF, to convert a PDF, or split pages. Um, PDF Candy, great place to go. So you can see I can rearrange pages. I can take that PDF and make it into a PNG. So fun website, thank you for that question. Yes, thank you for putting that in the chat as well, pdfcandy.com. Keep asking questions, I love it because I love learning new things as well. And so you're really engaging my brain. <laughs> so we've talked about creating master slides. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask a few more questions. Again, you can find the step-by-step -step processes on slides 13 through, um, let's see, how far did I go? Ah, uh, yes, 13 through 17 will help you with that step-by-step -step guide for creating a master slide. 
Slide 18 is how to change your deck to look like a piece of paper. We just went through that. So file page setup, go from 16 by nine to custom and change that to the size of paper you want. You can also do 11 by eight and a half. Nobody says that you have to go um, in portrait mode. You can absolutely do landscape mode. Another item that would be helpful for you in creating master slides, and especially for students when you want them to demonstrate their work, are taking a screenshot. So if you have not been able to uh, practice this, here's the keys that are the shortcut in order to take a screenshot. Now I only pulled the keyboard shortcuts for devices with keyboards. So if you have students with an iPad or with an Android phone, they are definite um, different steps for taking a screenshot. So you'll have to do a Google search for how to take a screenshot on an iPad. Um, it depends on the version of iPad as well. So you'll need to know if they actually have a home button on their iPhone or if it's an iPhone 10 or greater, there's no home button. So the screenshot process is different. So it's good to know the model. But let's talk about devices with keyboards for screenshots. When you press these keys, they need to be done simultaneously, but not all at the same time. So that's not what simultaneously means. What I'm describing is, let's take that I want, I want to take a screenshot in Windows. I can press the Windows key, then the Shift key, and then the S key. As long as I hold all three down at once, it will open up that feature to allow me to take a screenshot. I'll walk you through that process here in a second. In a Mac, it is Command Shift 3 and Command Shift 4. Command Shift 3 gives you the entire screen. Command Shift 4 lets you pick part of the screen. Windows Shift S lets you pick part of the screen. On a Chromebook, the Control Window Switchers buttons give you the whole screen and Control Shift Window Switcher gives you part of the screen. So that's why there's different keyboard shortcuts. So what does this look like? Right, I'm going to go up here to my example master slides and I want to take a screenshot of this Frayer model. So what I'm gonna do is on my keyboard, I'm gonna click Windows Shift S and my screen will go dark and I can move my mouse. You should see a little pointer, a little crosshair pointer here and I'm gonna click, hold and drag. So I'm only picking up part of the screen and when I let it go, the system gives me a noise and tells me that I've actually, I'm holding onto something like I've copied it. When I come up here to my slide deck, I can use my right mouse click and I can paste it or I can control V. And this is an immobile. I can resize it, but I cannot type on it screenshot. So this screenshot process is wonderful. When you have something you don't want students to click on, you don't want students to edit. I often will take a screenshot of a slide and pop it over here onto the side to remind them of something that we spoke about earlier in our lesson. So I can never find the screenshot after I've taken it. Where does it go on my computer? Most of the time your screenshot is held on like the same way you copy a URL or you copy a set of words. So you only have one opportunity to paste it. Um, you can change the settings so it goes to a clipboard. But for most of us, the default, it's that screenshot is never on the clipboard. So take a screenshot and immediately control paste it um, or right mouse click paste it where you need it to go. So the computer does not hold on to multiple screenshots unless you contact your friendly tech and ask them to set up a clipboard for you. So I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't, it hides on the computer. It's a temporary hold until you take another screenshot and then it erases the first one. It'll only hold on to one at a time. So it's a great question. Um, another way that I like to use screenshots is if we send students out to a website. Let's say that, for example, I really want students to show me a shape on a geo board. So if I send them out to the Math Learning Center, and I'm going to come up here to Resources, and I want some math apps. Right? And if you have not seen these math apps, I apologize for going so fast. <laughs> I <laughs> love the Math Learning Center. So it's mathlearningcenter.org. And we have this fantastic geo board. I'm going to open up the web app really quick. Let's say that I want to see what students build with that geo board. I need students to take a screenshot and bring it into Google Slides to type about why they built that. Did they incorporate 
three rectangles and two triangles and what does this shape represent? I want them to explain their thought processes. So that's where that screenshot comes in handy for students as well. So it's a great tip for both of us. Uh, yes, thank you for posting that. So um, your links, so apps.mathlearningcenter.org. And, okay, instructions. Like, I only have so much real estate on my master slide. So where do I put instructions? The um, tip that I usually like to do is to add a text box or a shape in that gray area. It's really handy when you have things set up as a piece of paper. So, sorry, let me go back to that one slide deck right here. See how much gray space I have? Lots of room for me to add additional instructions or helpful tips. The other place that I am a huge fan of putting in information is down here in the speaker notes. You might have to help students understand that there are three little dots right here where they can adjust the speaker notes to take up more or less room. Uh, but my students know to look on the sides or to look on the bottom to understand what they need to do with this slide. Does that make sense? Okay. Here we go, though. Wait a second. Why do I want to reinvent the wheel when I can borrow something that is already amazing? So I'm going to show you a couple of resources that will be really helpful for you, especially as the year gets started. And we're devoting time to getting to know our students. And let's, let's take somebody else's work and make it our own. Right? The first website I'd love to take you to is Teresa Wills. She has templates galore. If you are on slide 22, the link to Teresa's website is down here in the speaker notes, or you can click on the shape, this little screenshot of Teresa Wills' website, and the link is there for you as well. So let's open up Teresa's website. Look at all of these master slides that she has already made and ready for you to take. Amazing, right? So students can write a Twitter, like how would they promote a business that you have them, um, or if they're pretending to be a character in history, what would that character actually say on Twitter? It's a fun little engaging process. Here's a Venn diagram that's um, singularly colored, right? A page for you. If you have a lot of resources that you want to share, pop in those resources into each text box, and I'll show you how to make those links here in a second. Right? What do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? Lots of great little templates for you to pick up. So that's Teresa Wills, and this is great for many grade levels. It's not just focused on grades three through six. Okay, let's take a look at the next resource, which is Ditch That Textbook. There are 30 different templates for you to use just on this web page alone. So I wanted to refer you out to the Ditch That Textbooks templates. The link again is in the speaker notes or is right here on that shape. I don't know if you're noticing something about my slides as we're moving forward. I'll ask you to tell me if you noticed it. So you can easily create something called a thin slide. So thin slides are a concept where students are all working in the same deck. So you have all 36 of your students in one slide deck, and we'll go through how to do that too. And in thin slides, it's their chance to pick one slide, you have one word, and they have to find a picture that represents that one word, and then they randomly get called upon to explain their thought process. So it's a really fun, engaging way to say, go through your vocabulary words. They're not writing a definition, they're finding a visual representation for that word. And so that's ditch that textbook. Another place that we can go is the Ready Teacher Toolbox. So if you are using Ready, I have something for you, I am folks as well. If you are using Ready, when you sign into your dashboard, you go under Assess and Teach, and you go straight to that Teacher Toolbox. When you're in the toolbox, you're going to pick your grade level, you're going to find your lesson and the session, right? So unit lesson session, and you're looking for explore, develop, or refine. These are PowerPoints though. 
So they are made for live in-person teaching. They perfectly align with the curriculum because they're made by Ready. But what we need to do in order to get them into Google Slides so students can use them as well, it's a little bit of a step-by-step -step process. So grab the PowerPoints. They're great for teaching if we need to put them into Google Slides for students. I made you a quick little animated GIF for the process. What happens? When you are in the Ready Teacher Toolbox, you click on that PowerPoint presentation and it will ask you to open. When you click open, it's actually downloading the PowerPoint. I wish they would change the name from open to download. Um, and that download shows up in your downloads folder on your laptop. So what happens? is once you have, and this is the little screen um, cast that'll show you how to do that. Once you have that download, you'll need to go into Google Drive. So I'll show you that process here. Pick your folder and insert that download into the folder. It's gonna take a little bit to upload it, but when you go to open it, so I right mouse clicked and I open with Google Slides. It's going to keep it as a PowerPoint. So up at the top, can you see that little PPTX? This means that it's not a Google Slide Deck yet. So we have to go to File and Save as Google Slides to convert your PowerPoint into an editable Google Slide Deck. So it takes a little bit of um, manipulating and a little bit of work on your part to use the Ready Slides, but it's so helpful when you're guiding students through a lesson if you want them to see what you're seeing or have a copy of what you're seeing. All right. So for my friends that are using IM, there is a Google Drive folder with resources galore. Oh, Mary is amazing. Um, our entire CINA department is amazing, by the way. So just, I'm calling out Mary for I am, but I will give props to everyone as we go along. Um, the link to the Google Drive folder is available to everyone at CUSD, and it is in the speaker notes, and it is also linked on that image. So you can go straight to Unit 1, I am Grade 6, for your 2021 learning, and they are still adding resources every day. So I highly recommend it. Now, wait a second, what if I teach other curriculum other than I am? Delane, do you have a folder for me? Absolutely. So our CINA team has put together a curriculum guides folder and there is so much goodies in here. So many goodies? Yes. <laughs> so the link to the folder, if you already don't have it in Google Drive, is right here on slide number 28. I'm going to go live to this folder to show you where things are hanging out. So here it is. I have this. You know what? Let me um, increase the size a little bit. Okay. So we've got four subjects inside of the curriculum guides. I'm going to walk you through the ELA one. So let me double click ELA. And we want benchmark support. Or we can go into a grade level. So let's say I want to go into grade four. And let me shrink this. So Judy has done an amazing job. Benchmark resources for 2021 online learning. When I double click on that folder, it is broken down by unit. Oh my gosh, it is so powerful. So let's say that I want to look at unit one, government in action. And then we need individual lessons, right? So we've got benchmark daily lessons, but let me open up grammar, spelling, and vocabulary. Look at all the slide decks that are ready to go. You can make a copy of these and use them with your students. You can use them live just to run your lessons. Students don't have to have a copy of it, but they have put together all of this work so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So just absolutely amazing, this curriculum guides folder. Um, if you're looking for math, I, I wanted to show you that there will be some additional information coming into math. So let me quick go to that folder here. They are going to be producing an online resource guide for you. They're still working on it. It should be ready by Monday, and it's going to have links for things that you can use with your students ready to go. So. Look for the email from Jennifer about the 2020 online learning resource guides. This is just a sneak preview for you. Okay, questions about how to locate the curriculum guides 
or any of the items inside of it. Okay, feel free to ask them in chat, even if it's 10 minutes from now. <laughs> Let's talk about Benchmark. Benchmark has a virtual learning resource embedded into it. Now, I will tell you, as of right now, when you go into Clever, Benchmark has disappeared, and it's okay. They are changing student information, so you don't have a direct link to Benchmark at this time. Email your friendly local TOSA or email Judy, and she will give you a generic username and password to get into Benchmark if you'd like to see it right now and you're unable to sign in. So it will come back. It's just this week they're doing that student um, data information changeover. So I'm signed in with a generic account into Benchmark. And on this very first screen, they have virtual learning. So when I click on virtual learning, it takes me through a bunch of guides and information. So I'm going to scroll a little bit to get you to the best part. So I'm going to keep going. And right here, it says go to distance learning activities. When I open up distance learning activities, it is broken down with a get starting letter by grade level and this fantastic Google Drive folder, it's amazing, inside of our slide deck. There's a PDF for student companion slides. This is a linkable PDF that forces you to make a copy, and that's okay, right, of all of the resources for virtual learning and benchmarks. So let me take you to this PDF really quick so you can see what this looks like. Again, the link is in the speaker notes or you can click on the shape itself to get to the link. So let's say that I teach fifth grade and I need unit one week two. I can click on unit one week two and it says, would you like to make a copy? Yes, please. I would absolutely like to make a copy of this slide deck. And it should take about five seconds and all of a sudden, I have a ready-made slide deck for that week's activities. Two thumbs up for this one, right? Scroll through so you can see a place for students to type. Right? Okay. How are we doing so far? Okay. We're looking good. So you can create your master slides from scratch, and sometimes it's a lot of fun to do that. But sometimes we just need what we need. Somebody else has probably already done the work for you. Another piece before we move away from master slides is, I can hear you thinking, but you know, the Google slide templates might be a little bit boring. I want something new. Here are three different resources for you to grab fun templates. So Slides Carnival, Slides Mania, and Slides Go. And each one of these websites, when you click on the icon, you can hover over to get to the link, has a variety of templates to mix up your visual appeal. I know that I have a tendency to just default to the white blank version, but our younger students love when you find templates that look like space or templates that look like an upcoming holiday to celebrate your students in class. But the newest one that I found last night, and I'm, I'm really excited about this one, comes from Slides Mania. So let me see if I can click on it, if I can find it. Zoom is hiding a lot of my tabs. So where are you hiding? Oh, I pinned it. Look at me, I'm smart. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about pinning here in a second if you'd like. So Slides Mania just released a Google Slides template that looks like a YouTube channel. How cool is this? So you can borrow their free template and it is a recreation that you can insert YouTube videos and make it look like YouTube, but students are safe inside of your slide deck. So go to Slides Mania, look for the YouTube channel. Um, I can actually just paste this link right now into the chat if you wanna pop over there. So let me do this. So there's the URL to get to this YouTube mock-up inside of Google Slides. So I found that on Twitter. So thank you, Slides Mania, for posting that on Twitter. <laughs> Just absolutely fabulous. But such cute templates if you're ready to build things from scratch. Okay, so let me close out of a couple of things here. All right. Let's move on. Talk about how to insert a link. So if you heard me referencing 
on the deck, just go ahead and click on the shape and it'll take you to the link. You can see the URL. How did I do that? If you're new to this process, the step-by-step -step instructions are on slide 33 and 34. So let's take a look at slide 33 and I will do this live for you as well. What you need to do is create a shape or a text box and you are going to go up to insert and then find link. Then you can paste a URL there. So let's do a live demo of what that looks like. So I'm going to come to my play slide deck here and I'm going to insert a blank slide. Let's do title only. That's fine. So we'll do demo links. I'm going to show you what it's like with a shape to add a URL to a shape. So let's go ahead and pick something really quick. Students love smiley faces. <laughs> so I have this fantastic smiley face and I want to be able to get a URL to help kids find a resource. What I can do is I can go up to insert and find link or I can come to my menu. The link is right there. Or I can use a keyboard shortcut, which is control K. Now I'm not sure why it's K and why it's not control L and who determined that it was control K, but there it is. <laughs> so it says paste a link or search. Guess what? I don't have to know everything. So I know I want kids to go to National Geographic and I know there's a kids website. So I'm going to start typing in kids national, if I can spell correctly. Look at this. It will provide me with the URL to the website just by typing in a couple of words. So kids.nationalgeographic.com. I never would have remembered that. It puts the URL there. Then you click on apply. So now your shape has a direct link to an outside resource. So if I click on the shape, there's a little preview of it. Is that not a great feature? Another way to put in a link is to just one word. So if I choose to use a text box, I can either go up to insert and select text box, or I can use the image icon at the top. I'm going to drop in a text box here and I want students to go to that geo board. Right? So let me increase the font size here so you can actually see what I'm doing. And oh, Ariel's boring. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with Ariel. So I don't want the shape to be clickable. I want the word to be clickable. How do I do that? So I'm going to triple click. That gives me the word. You can also double click to get the word. See how that turned blue? I can go up to insert link. I can use the link button or I can control K. And I really want them to go to the Math Learning Center geo board. So let's see if it can find it for me. Math Learning Center geo board. Now, sometimes Google doesn't quite understand exactly what we're looking for, and I can't see the entire URL, so I'm not quite sure that that's the correct link that I want. So what I can do instead is actually go get the link. So here's the GeoBoard link that I found earlier. I'm going to click in that address bar so I get the whole URL, and I can right mouse click copy, or I can control C, whatever you're most comfortable with, and I'm going to return to my slide deck here. And in that box where it says paste a link, I'm going to right mouse click and paste so I know it is the exact link that I want for my students. When I click apply, that word now becomes underlined and the color changes to indicate that it has become a hyperlink. So when I hover over the shape, you can't tell that there's a link. When I hover over the word, you can't tell that there's a link. So students definitely have to click on these items to find the links. Does that make sense? Okay, so two ways to do that. Link a shape or link an individual word. You can also link a sentence or a paragraph. Um, so it's up to you what you want to highlight. Another fun thing that I like to do, and I will show you an example of this later, is to actually link slides. So let's say that I want students to be able to jump to the first slide quickly without having to scroll a lot. What I want to do is insert a shape. So let me come here and I will do just something really quick. Let's use this. And I can tell it when students click on the shape, please go to slide number one. 
So I'm going to do control K. And do you see this little menu that says slides in this presentation? When I click on that drop down, it'll let me pick what slide I want to go to. Previous slide, first slide. So I actually want it to go to slide number one. When I click on apply, when it's selected, you can see slide number one. And when I click on it, I immediately go to slide number one. So linking to have students bump in between slides in that same slide deck is a fantastic feature. And I show you that process on slide number 34. So insert a shape or insert an icon and then select slides in this presentation instead of using paste a link or search. How are we doing so far? Questions? Okay. Again, okay, feel free to use that chat. So let's talk about how do we find images and icons? Um, how do you make this interesting? So the first thing that I recommend, especially with students, is using the Explore tool that is built into Google Slides. Um, particularly with our younger students, I don't want them out doing a Google image search. It can be like the wild, wild west sometimes um, if they are not comfortable or familiar with filtering and narrowing their search. So I like to start them out from the beginning and very simply. So what does that look like? Let's go to our demo slide deck. Oh no, that is not the button that I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, right? <laughs> okay, let's try this again. That zoom control got right under my mouse. Here we go. So here is our demo deck, and I'm actually going to slide this over so I don't accidentally do that again. And let me insert um, a blank slide. And we are going to take a look at finding an image. So down here at the bottom, we have a little explore button, right? So when I click on explore, it opens up a side tab for me where I can do a search. So let's say that I want to search for a flower. Oh, right here. So let's do flower and this fun little Google search. So clearly I need to search for flowers, but it takes me to the web. What I need are images. And well, the first thing I tell students is please don't scroll. If you don't see what you need on that first screen, you need to give Google more information. So we're kind of embedding digital citizenship and teaching them how to be responsible, teach them how to let Google know what they want. So I hear, well, Mrs. Johnson, I really, really want pink flowers. Okay, great. No, but this isn't what I want either. So then I ask students, well, what is it that you're looking for? And the student will probably tell me that, you know what, they want roses. Okay, so you're gonna keep typing. And so you want pink roses. Well, now I have some lovely pictures to pick from without having to scroll. When a student is interested in uh, getting those pictures in, you are going to have them hover over the picture and see there's a little plus button here. You can insert image. You can also click, hold and drag and that absolutely works. Um, but I'm gonna click on insert image. Another reason why I highly recommend using the explore tool that is built into Google Slides is you know exactly where that photo came from. As we talk about crediting sources and building out works cited or their resources, three days from now, a student is not gonna remember where they found that picture if they did a Google search. Using Explore, that link is automatically brought in with that picture so they can begin to build out their references. So I highly recommend from a digital citizenship standpoint using Explore so they can go straight to the website and be able to build out their references. Now for us as teachers though, sometimes we just know what we need and Explore is not quite working for us. And that absolutely happens. Um, I am a huge fan of using Google search for me as a, um, a personal user. So what can I do? What we need to do is go out to Google and I'm gonna open up a new tab here and I'm gonna to continue to do that 
that search. So I'm going to type in flowers. And instead of being under all, I want to go straight to images. Oh, that's a lot of variety of flowers. So we're going to use the tools that are available inside of Google search to help us narrow down what we need. And oh, yes, thank you, Diane, for pointing out these are definitely safe images. Help them with their search terms. I also like to do, if we're working on vocabulary, I will come in and do a quick search for some of the vocabulary words to make sure that the images um, kind of align with what we want to teach. I will ask them not to do specific words. Um, I've run across words like scorched that sometimes have an image that I don't feel is appropriate for that grade level. Um, so it depends on your students and you'll get to know them well on whether or not that particular vocabulary word is a good example of this particular image search. So yes, thank you for bringing up that point. Um, when we as teachers are outside in Google, we can, yeah, I wanna point out safe search is on. So that's um, a default that we have. You can use this little tools button here. So I know that I actually want to look for orange flowers. And I'm going to pick on color and go straight for orange. Wow, look at that. I also know that I don't want a very large picture. It's going to take up too much room on my Google slide. So I'm going to come up here to size. And I'm going to say, you know what, I need about a medium sized picture. Oh, these are gorgeous. The other thing that I like to do, and this is just a personal choice, is usage rights. Um, I like to make sure that it's okay for me to use. I'm not publishing my work, but I feel like I need to model good behavior. And so when students are watching me do my search, I always come in here for non-commercial reuse and modification. So these pictures are all roughly medium-sized orange flowers that are available for me as a teacher to use. These are absolutely gorgeous. Now, how do I get them into my slide deck? So let's say that I want to use this one here. I'm gonna click on that image so it brings up the black side pane. I'm gonna take my mouse and hover over it, right mouse click on that image, and I'm going to copy the image. You can also copy the image address if you'd like to model good di digital citizenship and referencing your work. But we want the image, and we're gonna to come to our presentation, and we're going to right mouse click and paste it. And there it is. If you notice, there's no link. So by going out to Google search, I don't actually know where that picture went or where that picture came from unless I make a note of it right away by using that right mouse click and copy the image address. Um, I'm sorry, or the link address. Both of those will work. So helpful in, for you for that digital citizenship piece. Um, you can actually click, hold, and drag. So this is a fun little trick, and it takes some magic mouse movements or trackpad movements. If I click on this image and I push it up into the tab, then I can bring it back down onto a slide. Oh, that made it unhappy. That happens sometimes too. Um, so if you miss, <laughs> like I just did, it's going to open up that picture in the website. So like I said, it takes some magic fingers and some practicing. Here we go. Let's see if I can get this on my slide. Now it's happy. <laughs> so I went too far over here on the left. <laughs> so that's one way to get images uh, into your slide decks. So use that explore button in the lower right when you're encouraging students to search. Um, but if you need to go out farther and do a Google image search, definitely use those tools. Um, I would love to show you another way to get icons. So let's look at my slide deck really quick. There is something that has shown up on every single one of my slides that indicates that there's a link did you notice it right away? Somebody want to type it in the chat? What did you see? Oh, maybe nobody caught it. Look at me being sneaky. There it is. Yes, thank you, Chris. So in the lower right-hand corner on most slides, sometimes it's in the upper left, sometimes it's lower left, I use visual indicators to help my students understand that there's a link on this slide somewhere and they need to go hunting for it. So I use that little finger click pointer to let you know that there's something that you can click. 
or you need to check the speaker notes because there's information. But when did I find this little click? When did I find this little button? So there's an add-on called Icons for Google Slides. It is amazing. So I'm gonna do a live demo of Icons for Google Slides for you. And if you click this link, it'll take you to where you can install it on your um, Chrome browser, right? So it'll stay inside of Google Slides. So here I am, I'm in my presentation and this add-ons button is up at the top of the menu. When I click on add-ons, it takes me down to icons for slides and docs, because I already have it installed, and then I'm gonna click on start. It opens up a side pane, just like in Explore, and I wanna search for an icon, and let's say that I wanna search for a star. So I'll type in star and hit enter, and there are a to so many stars to pick from. If your icon that you see that you like is in black and white, it will typically be eligible to be recolored. So it's a fun part of this icons. So let's say that I really like this set of stars right here. And even though it shows up as a black picture, I can change that to green or I can change those to purple. So it's a way for you to be able to, again, insert some personality and make things individual. The other thing that you can do is change the size. So 128 pixels is pretty big. And it's gonna take up a really decent portion of my slide. So I'm gonna bump this down to about half, about 64 pixels. And then I'm gonna click on insert. And it should take about five seconds for it to create it. And here we go. Here is my 64 pixel colorized stars. So I can use that to help students understand that there is an activity they need to do or help them to understand that they should put on their headphones at this point in the lesson. So finding those icons that help represent classroom management or in my case, links, um, or I'll find a pencil when they need to type um, or a keyboard if you want them to you know, type or write. So it's really fun to be able to use icons to help students understand what that expectation is for the slide. So again, this is on slide 39, if you'd like to install icons for Google Slides. And we can take you to that site really quick. So you can see the process to install. I'm gonna go straight to install now. It's going to take me to um, the Google Web Store that's called the G Suite Marketplace here. If you have not installed it, it'll be a big blue bar that says install. So you'll click on that big blue bar and then it'll walk you through the process to approve it to be installed for Google Slides. So it's a quick three or four clicks to get you to a place where you can start using that add-on icons for Google Slides. How are we doing? Okay, Got a fantastic moderators and friends that are answering questions for each other, so I appreciate you all. Let's talk about using audio and video, right? How do we get these extra resources that are so helpful for our students into our slide decks? So, really quick, a word. <laughs> YouTube is not freely available for students. You need to find a YouTube link and then email that link to Sherry Johnston or Chris Edmondson so it can be whitelisted. So it is not an open YouTube experience. If you insert a video into your Google Slide Deck, you will need to take that long URL and email that again to Sherry or to Chris. Now what they are looking for is the link that includes youtube.com. There are shortened links that exist out there, and I believe it's Y-O-U-T-U dot B-E. So it looks like YouTube, but it doesn't have the dot com attached to it. They want the full links. So if you have five or six links that you want for the week, you can send that whole stack. You can send it to your friendly neighborhood TOSA, or you can send it directly to Sherry and Chris. We will make sure that you have those items whitelisted. And to be kind, um, try to give them you know, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, they aren't always available to turn that around for you five minutes before your lesson. So you might wanna check the day before to have those videos whitelisted. Um, Sherry has been amazing, Chris has been amazing, 
exhausting, but I know that they are also very busy. <laughs> so I try to give them a little bit of a heads up and some time to get that whitelisted. Um, a question that I have gotten in the past is, is there a library? Do we know what has already been whitelisted? At this point, no. I don't have a list of every single video that's been whitelisted by all of the teachers across Clovis Unified. So just go ahead and send in that link. Sherry or Chris will let you know when it's ready to go. Um, most likely, if it's a very popular video, some teacher has already asked for that link, and um, you can check in with that. Um, if it's for your grade level, every teacher doesn't need to submit it, just one of you needs to email. Okay, so we're going to walk through how to insert a video, and I'm going to show you where to find that full URL so you can email it to make sure that it is open for students to take a look at. Your step-by-step -step instructions are going to be on slide 42 if you'd like to take a look at it there. But let's do the live version. Okay, so I have this slide. And there is a YouTube video on earthquakes that I really want to insert for my students. Um, there is a question about a safe YouTube link. So when we're in Google Slides, we can't insert videos that are embedded unless it is in Google Drive or directly in YouTube. So if I have an outside resource with a video, I have to use that link process that we talked about earlier. So this is a great question. So I would have to make a shape and embed a link to, you know, safe YouTube.net. Um, Google Slides blocks us from inserting anything other than YouTube.com or Google Drive. So hopefully that makes sense. You'll have to use the link process, not the insert process. It's a great question. And then they are whitelisted forever once they have been approved by Sherry or Chris. So that's also a fantastic question. So if you have um, a video that you whitelisted last year, it will continue to be whitelisted. Thank you for that. I know that whitelisting process is very important as we um, think about protecting our students and making sure that they're safe on YouTube. So I appreciate those questions. I want to find this earthquake video, right? So I'm going to come up to insert and I'm going to select video. Now I don't have to know the direct URL yet. It's helpful if you do, but I'm just going to search YouTube and see what happens. So let's see, I'm going to type in earthquakes and do a quick search and let's see what happens. Oh, I've got National Geographic. I've got, oh, I'm not sure I want students to watch a live earthquake. Ooh, we're talking about magnetic storms. Oh, Dr. Binogs. Yes, I like this particular video. I also like crash course videos. So what I can do is I can click on the video that I want and hit select. The next thing that I'm going to do is watch this entire video before I send it out to students and before I give the link to Sherry. I want no surprises, <laughs> right? Um, even if we are familiar with that channel, there are still some things that we have to make sure that our students are and our parents are okay with. So I will take the time to watch this entire three minute and 43 second video from start to finish before asking Sherry to whitelist it. How do I watch the video? I, I can click a little play button over here on the side. That got really loud for me all of a sudden. <laughs> um, I can resize the video. I can play it here on the slide as well, right? So there's two options for you. Now, how do I get the link to Sherry or to Chris? When you are in this video, do you see these three little dots? I like to call them the three olives. It's available on both of these, right? So we'll click the three little dots and it says copy link. Now I'm not sure what I'm copying. So wait a second here. So we're gonna go to the three little dots. There's, sometimes it works for me, it's not gonna work for me today. <laughs> okay, so I've copied the link. What I need to do is test it. So I'm gonna come up here to Google and I'm gonna go all the way up to the address bar and I'm gonna paste it. Oh no, the link that I copied is that u2.be. So this isn't the link that will be useful for CUSD. So what I have to do is go directly to YouTube and let me click pause because that's going to be a surprise for me. <laughs> now do you see the youtube.com link? This is the one that you want to send, right? Um, there's the share button down here that's available at the bottom. The share button gives me that youtube.be as well.
So make sure that you're looking for that full link that you can get up there in the address bar. Um, how are we doing so far? Yep. Okay, great. I answered that question. So taking a look at chat there. So embedding YouTube, very easy, really fun for students to be able to watch a video without having to leave and go into YouTube. But that whitelist process will just take you a little bit of extra time and it's well worth the time. How do I do this if I already have the URL um, and I don't need to Google search? So I can come up into YouTube and I want to search for, um, let's talk about the mantle. Again. Oh, look, Mickey Mantle. This is why we don't want kids out in YouTube. <laughs> None of this is a proper Google search for our students. So what I like to do is add a couple of extra words. Mantle for kids. That is my saver. Wow, it's a completely different search result. <laughs> so here we go. I want to include this layers of earth for students, or maybe I want the geosphere. Right? So there's lots of different options. If I am looking for that link directly from YouTube first before inserting it into the slide deck, I'll have to click on the link, come up here and get the full URL. Sorry, that got very loud for me again. Um, so again, highlight the URL and I'm going to right mouse click and copy it. I will go into my slide deck, go up to insert, video, and there's an option at the top that says buy URL. So it must be a YouTube URL. If we try to use SafeTube, if we try to use Vimeo, it won't let you insert that video. So it definitely has to be YouTube. And then we'll click on select. And that video will be available for me to preview all three minutes and 13 seconds before I ask for it to be whitelisted. <laughs> so that's YouTube and embedding that into our slide decks, it's really helpful when we want students to watch a concept and then type about it. So one thing that I would do is insert the video and then take this text box and put it right underneath the video and have students answer a question or two by typing in a response. All right, so they're going to take time to watch the video and then answer my questions. So you can either put your questions on the side here in the gray box, like we talked about earlier, or you can add your questions into that text box and let them go from there. All right, so step-by-steps on slide 42. Although not directly video, I did wanna talk about the webcam really quick. Sometimes students need to do work on paper. And so there's a tool for every activity, right? It's not always about Google Slides or Google Docs or being online and doing the GeoBoard. So I use the webcam to take a picture of my daughter's math homework. Sorry, it's a fuzzy picture. I should have had better lighting. <laughs> but the process to use the webcam, I cannot live demo for you right now because Zoom is using my webcam. But I can get you part of the way there. So students can go up to Insert, and then they're going to say Image and they can do camera. So they have to allow the camera to be used. So when I click on camera, it's going to give me an error because Zoom is using it. You can't do two things at once, <laughs> but there's a pop-up window. Students must click allow in order for the camera to be turned on. And then I like to have them hold up a book and describe the plot of the book or tell me where they are. Like you've read up to chapter two, what's the most interesting thing that's happening in the book so far um, up to chapter two? or in this example, their math homework, and they need to tell me how they got to that answer by typing in a text box. So the webcam to take a quick picture is a fantastic way to use Google Slides um, for anything that needed to be done outside or offline. Right, so it's the equivalent of a live screenshot. Um, so can we insert videos from history.com or the History Channel or Brain Pop? So you can use other videos, but you'll have to take students to an outside link to get there. So embedded videos are only from YouTube or only from Google Drive. So let's say that you have a video of you talking and you have it stored in Google Drive. You can easily add that video into the slide. But if we're looking at Brain Pop, I won't be able to insert directly into a slide a video from BrainPop. What I have to do is use that link process. 
So I'm going to call this Brain Pop Video. I have to highlight it, go up to Insert, Link, and then paste the link to that particular Brain Pop video. So I'm just going to do the basic website right now, brainpop.com. But it's just like taking them to the website. I know, I wish we could insert videos from other resources, but Google Slides is locked down specifically to YouTube or to Google Drive. So thank you. Great questions. Okay, so we talked a little bit about video and finding video from YouTube, from Google Drive, or from an outside resource. BrainPop has amazing resources, right? And using the webcam for students to take pictures of a physical book or of handwritten notes. Um, I want to show you a website that I like using. So now this is a teacher-only website. I am not recommending for students to sign up to otter.ai. We have privacy agreements in place. So this is for you as an adult to use to help your students with hearing your voice and having you read to them. So otter.ai is totally free. And what I love about Otter is it makes a transcript of your recording. So as you record, it is typing out what you write. You can edit that transcription so it actually matches what you say. And it's been pretty correct for me so far. I've only had to, um, for example, for a math problem, I exchange the word equal for the symbol equals, right? Or if I say seven times three, I want to replace the word times with an X so it looks like a math problem. For the most part, it has been spot on with what I've been trying to record. So otter.ai, how you can use this with students. So again, this is for you to read to or talk to students, not for students to do this for you. Um, you want to record your voice and then give students the link to that recording. I gave you an example of me speaking out a math problem on slide 45. So you can find the link to that math problem on one of these shapes. So somewhere around here, there's a link. You see the little <laughs> reminder, right? Or you can go into the speaker notes. Well, let me show you what Otter looks like. So I provided a link to a recording for students. When I click play, it's actually going to use that follow the bouncing ball process. And I know I don't have my um, sound turned on, but I wanted you to see the process. So as my voice, is talking, those words are highlighted. How powerful is this for our students, right? So for them to be able to see what you've said and follow along with you. So this is one of the reasons why I love Otter is that transcription. Now, if you don't wanna take students out to an external link to look at your transcription, you just want them to have your voice. You can absolutely do that with Otter. So in slide 46, I walk you through the process to download that Otter file move it into Drive, and then you can do the insert audio process. And so this little symbol right here is my actual audio file from Otter. And when I click play, all you do is hear my voice. You don't have the, you know, follow the bouncing ball process. Okay. So again, we went up to insert, audio, and then I had to take that audio and bring it into Google Drive. Um, another kind of side note is sharing permissions. So um, a lot of times when something is stored in our drive, it is private to us. And so if I insert audio that it has been set to private to me, students won't be able to listen to it. So that's why I've included this screenshot about get a shareable link. Um, you wanna change those sharing settings uh, so students can hear your audio. So that if that's a feedback that you get from your students, like I see the button, but I can't click on it, um, you'll want to change that to get a shareable link. Okay, um, there is no subscription for Otter. It is totally free. So I signed up for the free version and um, I have not had any issues. I believe we get uh, 300 minutes a month for free of recording. So if I'm recording more than 300 minutes, that's a lot of talking. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, I found that the free version is perfectly acceptable for me and what I need to do. Okay, uh, any other questions about audio, video, inserting links?
finding images. Um, again, feel free to ask anything, even from the first 15 minutes. All right, I want to spend some time talking about how to get your activities, your interactive Google Slides out to your students. All right, so one of those things is sharing with students. How do we get it there? Um, we should be using Google Classroom to get assignments out to students. You may have another process, right, but the district recommendation while we're in online learning is Google Classroom. So if you are brand new to Google Classroom, I have inserted on slide 50 a link to intro to Google Classroom. So I've got you covered on this one. Step-by-step -step guide on how to set up a classroom, how to get the class code out to students, how to create assignments, how to personalize your classroom. So feel free to use that to help get yourself familiar with classroom. Um, one of the pieces inside of classroom is that you can attach assignments. You can attach a file that you have stored in Google Drive. Now, if I have a slide deck and I set it up as an attachment, there are three ways that students can engage with that slide deck. So the first way is students can view. That means all they're doing is looking at the slide deck. They will not be able to type on it. They won't be able to add images. They won't be able to do anything but just look. And sometimes that's what we need. But for the most part, we want options two or three. And so that's students can edit a file or students um, can get an individualized copy. So option number two. Students can edit. It means that everyone is inside of one file, and I encourage you to embrace the mess. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a live example of that coming up. Um, and it has yesterday's session's information. So before I ask you to go there, I'm going to show you a process about reverting a Google slide when somebody's made a mistake or a little bit of an error. So that's why I left yesterday's session in there to give you a really good example of how to fix what might have gotten messed up. So we're going to practice option number two. Students can edit a file. Let's talk about option number three really quick. When you add an assignment in classroom, there is number three, make a copy for each student that's only available for you for a brand new assignment. If you have an existing assignment and you go to include an attachment, make a copy doesn't exist. So this is a one time, got to do it the first time you set it up, or you need to make a new assignment. Um, so make a copy means every student in class gets their own version of that slide deck. It is not shared with anyone but you. So there won't be any collaboration unless students manually add another student into that slide deck. So make a copy is a great way. It's kind of like taking your paperwork and going to the photocopier, but it is online and everyone gets to do their own editing. So let's do a live example of what it means for everyone can edit. And before you pick a slide, I'm going to take us there, but I'm going to walk you through the process for when students say, I lost all my work, or, um, you know, Johnny really messed up everything. How do I fix it? I'm going to take you through that process. So on slide 49, there is a bit.ly link called IGS All About Me. And so this, I'm going to paste this into chat as well. Um, this is a fun way to get to know your students as a first week icebreaker. Um, if this is something that interests you, so you can absolutely make a copy of this slide deck if you'd like, or make one of your own for practice. So I pasted the bit.ly link into the chat. You do need to be signed into your CUSD account in order to access this particular link. Normally, I'd put it inside of Google Slides, or I'm sorry, Google Classroom, but I didn't want to ask you to join Classroom and then find the assignment. I thought it would just be a little bit faster for you to find it through this bit.ly link. Okay, so um, while we're all getting there, don't click on your slide yet. I want to show you how to clean it up first, um, but I want to give everybody a chance to get to All About Me. So we have a question. If we wanted students to take a picture of an assignment to check understanding, is there a fast way to review all of their work um, versus clicking on each kid's submission? So I often will go into Google Drive to find a classroom assignment. And so while everybody's getting into All About Me, let me take you over, hey, no judgment about my drive, right? <laughs> so let me take you over to my drive. Shh, don't look at the man behind the curtain. I'm gonna open up my classroom folder.
And so I will take you to my 1920 APCSP class. And let's see if I can find an assignment that would have had them um, creating, let's see here. Here we go. Um, so what we have is uh, students' information. I like to use this preview icon to take a look at what students are doing. So if it's a slide deck, you can scroll through and then use this over arrow button to get to the next student, to get to the next student, to get to the next student. So that's kind of my little shortcut for getting into um, student work as a preview. Okay, perfect, yes. So I'm gonna get us in, or finally get me into this All About Me slide deck, and let's see how many people have joined us. <laughs> it looks like somebody might have even changed the name to All About Us. <laughs> so that's, this is what I'm saying, embrace the mess. This is actually my file, so I'm going to rename my file again, um, but students have access to it. This is what can edit can do. So I can tell that there are 25 of us in the slide deck. So I'm happy that you're able to join. And um, yep, you can see live editing happening. What I'm going to do is demonstrate how to get a slide deck back to its original version. So you can see that we've had students have a lot of fun inside of this slide deck. So up here at the top, do you see this version history? The last edit was made. I'm going to click on my version history, and I can tell people have been busy, right? I can hit this little arrow, and I can see details about who did what, and it's colorized. So this is amazing when you're looking at peer and collaborative work with students. I am not shy. I show them the version history. I tell them that I'm looking at the version history. So if there's an expected um, guideline that you will have worked on this on three separate days. You know that I'm in here looking to make sure that three separate days that student has been signed in and has made edits. So I'm going to scroll down to find the version history that I want. Okay, so I'm going to click on this August version history and I can see that everyone else's work from yesterday is clean and it is no longer there. So I'm going to pick this version and I'm going to restore it. If you are watching and you are live on that deck, you're gonna see everything magically erase and get restored. So this is how you can find, for a student that is devastated, it looked right at three o'clock, Mrs. Johnson, I don't know what's 10 a.m. today and I don't know what happened, help them out and go back into the version history to restore the 3 p.m. version. Okay, so your task is to Find your student number, change the title to your name, share three interesting things, and include an image or a picture. So here's my example. I have my name, I have some pictures, and three things about myself, right? So what you can do, I included links to help students find their appropriate slide. Now, why did I do this? <laughs> here we go. Do you see slide number seven? It says seven over here. I often will get student number seven trying to work on student number one's slide. So I quickly added in a little reminder that this belongs to student one. And so if they find their number, if I'm student 14, I'm actually jumping to slide 20 so I can be student 14. So I encourage you to find a slide that is empty. Practice that jumping feature if you like. If you notice, I've got three friends. Well, now I have two friends in slide number seven. So you'll be able to see your colleagues buttons, like these little tiny circles. So try to find a slide that doesn't have somebody's circle in it and quickly put your name in the title. They'll know it's your slide. <laughs> so I invite you to make this as fancy as possible with something new that you've learned or something that you already have that's amazing that we all need to see. I'm happy to answer questions while you are typing on your slides. And I can't wait to see what you drop into this slide deck. Ooh, we have other Bitmoji friends. I'm seeing that show up. So I will gladly talk to you about Bitmoji. If you'd like to learn about that, let me know in the chat. Let's see what else is happening as I'm scrolling. Down. Oh, fancy font. That's beautiful. 
So this process, <laughs> okay, you're cracking me up. <laughs> See, I love this. It really gives me a chance to get to know my students. I get to understand what they're safe sharing. I said, you know, show me three different things or tell me three different things about yourself. I know that these are safe pieces. They'll probably tell you that they have animals. Um, they'll tell you how many brothers and sisters they have uh, or what they did over the summer because they went to this really fun pool party um, with their family. And it's just a great way to get to know your students at the beginning. Yes, okay, thank you. I, I love that you're watching. You get to see everything in action because I know um, not all of us can access both the slide and Zoom at the same time. Um, but this link is available for you if you're in the slide deck. Once Zoom is um, closed down, you can absolutely come back. This is a live uh, bit.ly. I may end up erasing your work tomorrow. So um, sorry, not sorry in advance. <laughs> Oh, but you are fantastic. Oh, I can see some sports fans are starting to pop up. Um, but just a really fun way. Oh, we have a fancy background. Yes, lots of fun bit emojis. Oh, music teacher possibly or somebody that loves music. So I get a really fast and quick overview of your personalities without actually clicking on any of these slides. Now, sometimes a student will try to get fancy. Oh, sure. Um, let me talk about how did I create the click on your number slide? Perfect question. So I <laughs> borrowed <laughs> this entire image from a website called uidownload.com. I did a screenshot um, and dropped somebody else's work in my slide. <laughs> and all I did was insert a shape. So I took a square or you could do, you know, a circle or a rounded rectangle. Um, I took a square and I dropped it right on top of a shape like this. Now, do you notice that it has that dark background? What I did is I went up to the paint bucket and I changed the fill color to transparent. All right, so if I click away, you still see the outline, but I can definitely see that number. What I then do is go up to insert, find link, and then I do slides in this presentation. Oops, I lost it. Okay, insert, link. <laughs> okay, it doesn't wanna behave. Is somebody trying to do this with me <laughs> live in real time? It happens. So I said embrace the mess with all of your students. Okay, it does not want to behave with me right now. Yes, we'll definitely do the Bitmoji thing. So insert link. Anyway, there is a piece where it says slides in this presentation, and you can then pick the slide that corresponds with the number that you're looking for. Uh, the other option that I do is I take out that border outline, and you can take out, so I made the shape transparent, right, so I can put this anywhere on the deck, but unfortunately it has that outline. Up at the top, there's a pencil icon, and then I change my border color to transparent, and now you have no idea that there's a shape, you just know that there's a link. So that was the process that I did. Um, I did an entire row of shapes. I actually didn't do the links. Um, I did the invisible shapes. I duplicated them across the row. I highlighted the entire row and then I duplicated them down. So I did not make 40 shapes. I only made one, copied it nine more times and then copied a group of 10 three more times. So like I said, I'm super lazy. So I try to find the shortest path to do all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the transparency and link guide, is that in the tutorial? I don't know that I necessarily um, pointed out how to make items transparent, but if you look inside of that intro to Google Slides, we definitely talk about color and fill and how to modify a shape. Uh, but, does somebody have a question? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute that. So um, the question was about Bitmoji. Um, somebody did, I've actually gotten a couple of these. Can we have this? Oh, please, take it and modify it for yourself. How can you do that? Up at the top, you go to File, and you make a copy. It's all yours. Please beg, borrow, steal. I'm more than happy. If you find this useful with your class, yes. 
Um, just don't be Mrs. Johnson, right? <laughs> okay, let's talk about Bitmoji. Ooh, Erica, that's a great, great website. I love that one. So I have Bitmoji installed in my Chrome browser. And I'm going to go to my blank slide presentation so you can see what this looks like. Um, when you have it installed, you do have to sign up for an account. I am not recommending this for students. This is exclusively for teachers and anybody over the age of 13. We do not have a privacy policy in place for students to have a Bitmoji, so please, just for you. Um, but when you are in Bitmoji, you can search for these fun little characters. And it's just... It's a silly way for students to get to know you. You can personalize your character so you can adjust your face, you can adjust your eyes and your lips, your hair color, your skin tone, the clothes that you're wearing. So I'm wearing my summertime outfit. Um, I will probably convert it to a more professional school outfit. <laughs> When fall rolls around, um, there's a scarf involved. I always, I always wear scarves in the winter. Uh, so I'm constantly updating my Bitmoji. And if you want to use um, a picture, so let's say that I want to do a quick celebration and I want to say thank you to everyone. All I have to do is click, hold, and drag. And that Bitmoji picture is transparent and I can put that anywhere on my slide deck. I can also resize it by using those sizer handles. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. Now, how do I get to Bitmoji? So I'm going to take you there really quick. So let's open up the Bitmoji website. I'm going to paste the link to the Chrome Web Store in the chat. So you can go straight to the Chrome browser to sign up for Bitmoji. You'll just click on the little install button from the Chrome Web Store. And as long as you are signed in, you can have this on your iPhone. Use that same account um, across all of your devices. I just happen to be signed into Chrome, so I can use it in my slide decks and be silly. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. Okay, let's see how people are doing in the All About Me file. And let's take a look at some of their creativity. Okay, so I'm going to scroll. Oh, I'm going to click on slide number nine. That's a lot of fun. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of Bitmoji friends. Um, I think this is me every morning drowning in coffee just to wake up. <laughs> I love that picture. Oh, somebody. Yes. Um, do you wish that she would let it go? Oh, that's such a terrible pun. I know. I, I couldn't help it. One thing, I, if you notice, I kept these instructions in the speaker notes. I didn't put the instructions in the gray side area. I put them down in the speaker notes so they didn't have to constantly jump to slide number two in order to know what they needed to do for this particular assignment. So it's very tiny font because I wanted them to see all of the steps at once. <laughs> that's why that's there. Oh, this is exciting. Classroom music. And we have some pictures. Look at the puppies. Oh, I love four-legged furry babies. We have a dancer. <laughs> Well, we can all dance. We just might not be happy with the results, Jason. <laughs> oh, so your creativity is absolutely amazing. And um, this is a great way to teach. I, did we have a student create this for you? Their artistic skills are phenomenal. Oh, look how fancy we are here. We're going surfing on the lake. So... Um, Students can definitely insert images if their parents have given permission for that. They can use the webcam to insert their face. I just caution you about using student faces. And for the most part, I ask them to insert an image of an activity that represents who they are. So if they love soccer or football, we're looking for sports images. If they love to sing, we're looking for notes or if they play an instrument. Um, so until you know what their privacy policy is from their parents, um, using a picture is probably not the safest thing for your students until you have those permissions in place. So day one, um, Parent Connect might not be updated to say, yes, it's okay for you to use my child's face. Um, and I, it's a slide deck. It is protected inside of CUSD. Um, I just know that I'm one of those parents where I'm not a fan of having my child's image anywhere. Um, she's getting older now, so she can make that decision for herself. But when she was in elementary school, 
um, I didn't want people having access to her picture. Um, I wanted her to be able to make that choice when she was 18, how her image was shared. So I'll get off that soapbox <laughs> really quick, but just a fun little activity um, to get started with your students and let them show you who they are. So again, if you're not sure how to use Classroom, we have those sessions that are going to be recorded. They'll be posted on the curriculum and instruction website. Um, so those resources, and hopefully we can get that link posted to the curriculum um, website where these sessions will be available for you next week. And one final thing before I give us some time for more questions is to talk about Pear Deck. Um, Pear Deck is a way for you to build out interactive slides with content that already exists. <laughs> um, so if you are interested in learning a little bit about Pear Deck, um, you can go straight to their website. Um, I will show you what the add-on looks like really quick, um, but contact your friendly local TOSA for additional information about Pear Deck. So let me show you what Pear Deck looks like. Again, this is an add-on. It exists inside of Google Slides. It is also a separate website. Pear Deck does have a premium model that is a paid subscription. I find that the free subscription works just as well for me. It's, it was nice having the, um, the upgraded version March through June, but I know that I don't really need them all. So you can see these little specialized stars. That means that these come with a paid version, um, but it's fine. I want students to be able to select a multiple choice and do a poll, or I want them to be able to type. And so if I would like to add a slide, right, I have this template, template library here, and I am going to ask students a question. So let's do a choice question. So what kind do we want? Do we want it to go on the student's device or a classroom projector? Well, we're definitely gonna do a student device here. And what are my options here? So just really quick, yes, no, and maybe. And we're gonna update the slide. So here we go. Pear Deck has told me that it is a multiple choice slide. When we run this as a presentation using Pear Deck with students, students get to respond to A, B, or C. Uh, when I'm ready to run it, I just click on Start Lesson. It'll produce a code, and I can share that code and that link inside of Classroom. So again, it'll take a little bit extra, not in the five minutes. Um, don't expect to be a Pear Deck master in this <laughs> quick rundown. Um, it took definitely time for me using it with students to really understand how it works. But if that is a process that would interest you, take a look at Pear Deck to build in polls and text responses um, you know, send students to a website. So just a fun, different way to build out engaging activities. With our final 10 minutes, I would love to be able to let you open up the microphone if you feel comfortable asking a live question or type in those questions in chat. I'll do one more reminder that if you are wanting to get credit for today's session, please go ahead and change your name to match your um, it's USD ID badge. So typically it's your full first name and your full last name. For those of us that have um, more than one first name or more than one last name um, and that's on your badge, you want to make sure that that is available here because uh, we'll be taking attendance inside of Zoom and I'll pull your participation from there so you can get credit. So questions. I am going to um, put us back for the link for this slide deck. In case you were not able to grab this link, we're gonna post it again in the deck. But I highly encourage you to come and borrow this link with the step-by-step -step instructions because I know three days from now, um, somebody will go, wait, what was that thing that we talked about? And it's there, you can always email me. Um, absolutely would love to engage with you or um, send you to someone that is in your area and get you connected with your TOSA. So let me type in my email address. Um, you can always do a search for me inside of Outlook, but I'm Delane Johnson at CUSD.com. And our link, oh, perfect, for today's website is that CUSD IGS. 
please feel free to share this with anyone that you feel um, might get some value out of it. If you have a colleague that hasn't been able to attend any of the sessions, yes, you can absolutely share this slide deck with them. Um, if you find that there's something that you can use for yourself, please, by all means, um, I'm happy to share my work and um, make life a little bit easier for you. <laughs> if it saves you some time, I know how precious time is. Okay, so let's see if we have any questions yet. So is there a way to lock text boxes so that students cannot move them but can still type in them? Unfortunately, I have not been able to figure that out. Um, so when you were thinking about that PDF example, right? We made it an image, we set the PDF as the background and I don't want students um, moving those text boxes. Unfortunately, no. In the master slides, you know, we can predetermine the location of the text box, but as with every um, blanket layout that's available in Google Slides, we have complete control as the user to move them up and down or left and right or accidentally delete them. <laughs> Students have been known to do. So I like to teach them about the undo button. <laughs> undo is your best friend, everybody. Um, so no, unfortunately, not having them locked into place. Um, Pear Deck can help a little bit with that. Um, if you are using, say, this text feature. Um, but for the most part, yeah, text boxes are completely movable and adjustable. So that is a great question. Uh, the only thing that I can recommend to lock it is they can't type on it, but your words will not be changed as if you take a screenshot of what you've written and then use that screenshot in place of the text box so students won't be able to adjust what you've written. Um, they may be able to move the image of the screenshot, um, but they won't be able to change the wording. Yes, it is being recorded and it will be posted on that um, curriculum and instruction website. Uh, so hopefully we can get that link to the website. I don't have it um, on hand at this exact moment. Um, I might have had it, but I think I closed out that slide deck. So um, we will definitely get the location for the presentation posted for you um, pretty soon. But um, Sherry will be emailing out links and follow-ups. So that um, curriculum instruction website will be there. Oh, hi, Sarah. Good to see you. Oh, so how to get to Pear Deck. Um, you can go straight up into add-ons and then click on Get Add-ons. And usually Pear Deck is one of the first ones that pops up in that image, because uh, it's so popular, like 10 million plus users, right? So you may have to search apps and you can type in Pear Deck if it's not one of the first ones that pops up for you. But I'll come in and I'll click on the image for Pear Deck. And then you'll click on that blue Install button to get it as a Slides add-on. Um, so that's one way to get it. You will need to create an account in order to use it. Um, I sign in with Google for Pear Deck, but if you like, you can go straight to the um, Pear Deck website. And they'll walk you through the process on how to use it. So the link to this website is in the slide deck. Um, I'll post it in the chat really quick too, um, but never fear if you have that um, CUSD IGS website, we've got everything for you. I know, because I need references, right? I can't remember something people told me 20 minutes ago, so <laughs> I need that backup and all of the links. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's get you back here. Um, I will not force you to remain until 3 o'clock. If you are good and you're ready for a stretch um, and you have all of the links and the resources that you need, I wish you a fantastic afternoon.